So I'd just like to um, to welcome everyone today to our, our very special parenting program uh, that we've set today. And we have Peter Marks with us for Conscious Care and Support. So Peter, please, thank you so much for um, coming to be with us today. It's a, a very special morning to have you here with us. So thank you. Okay. Please. Thank you, Jane, and uh, all you great folks at Community Living King Garden. It's great to be back with you, even if it's virtual. Um, so good morning, everyone. So glad you could join us today. I'll start with a, a logistic. Uh, we're going to go through a PowerPoint presentation, and I've made it pretty complete so that you'll be able to read this for your own reference when you have time. I'm going to highlight uh, several of the slides we go through and drill down on them, but there'll be some slides that I'll pass by fairly quickly, but just know that we've got there. The PowerPoint in itself is pretty complete, but uh, we're just going to focus on some of the key, the key messages, okay, in terms of our best practices. So I'd like to, I'd like to start this morning by um, giving you a message in three minutes it should take three hours because it's a sensitive message. Um, we're going to talk about the good and caring professionals who are supporting us in our endeavors to support our children and people we're supporting um, from general practitioners to behavioralists, educators, support professionals. And just, these are good caring people. And I do want to stress that as we go through, but I think there's a message that needs to be given. I give it for often and it's backed up with uh, solid, solid research that you're going to see as I unfold my presentation. But, um, just in spite of the, the work that's being done by so many great professions, uh, there's just still a very serious, I mean, a very serious support services problem that in the main is, is not necessary. So the provincial government, as you may be aware, announced this week that they're going to some of the gaps that we've been seeing and experiencing. And, and uh, I'm very optimistic uh, when I read it, certainly looking forward to the, to the details. And um, hopefully many of the concerns that we've had will be taken care of over the next, the next number of months and, and even years, you know. Um, the solutions that are going to be looked at in terms of systems, blockages, and wait lists, and all of that, um, just vital that we get them taken care of. But today, my, my focus will be more on what happens once family support professionals get into service and what happens there. So the services in general that are offered in Ontario relative to the recommendations of the consensus of international research and relative to the Ontario regulatory body, such as the Ontario Association of Behavior Analysts, um, highly credible advisory groups like uh, Autism Canada, Autism Ontario, um, Autism Speaks, uh, and then indeed the College of Family Physicians of Canada. All of these bodies are virtually offering recommendations, but the actual services they're receiving are incomplete. They're incomplete in accordance with what these bodies are, are asking us to do. And it's not a dollar problem in the main. It's not a resources problem in the main. We suggest that um, it's a significant part of the failure to meet these best practices is more of a won't problem than a can't problem. And I'm going to talk about that this morning and what we can do about it. But the research and even mandates of these service providers more than adequately addresses what should be done, but often is not happening. For example, the College of Family Physicians of Canada developed extensive treatment guidelines for the family physicians to follow and our experience in working with hundreds of families and dozens of support agencies indicating that adherence to these guidelines is, is less than adequate for sure. On TABA, the Ontario Association of Behavior Analysts um, directs all BCBAs to ensure that the biomedical comorbidities that are discussed in the family physician's guidelines um, are identified and, and uh, treatment given um, either prior to or concurrently with a behavior support plan. And uh, 
And often this, this isn't the case. So just to bring to your own personal experiences, just to think of someone who you're supporting right now and recall just the testing that's been done for them. Just to look at an example and the mention of these biomedical comorbidities. Has the person who you are, are supporting, child you're raising maybe, have they had testing? This is all in accordance with international research and these regulatory bodies. Uh, zinc and copper testing is critical. Uh, magnesium, calcium, iron, mercury, lead, sulfur, vitamins, big vitamins, B12, B3, B6s, the C's and E's, omegas for sure. Glutathione, glutathione that can be supplemented through a compound called NAC. Uh, research indicates 72% in improvements on, on the aberrant checklist, behavioral checklist, after two months of on a therapeutic level of NAC that then that, that improves glutathione levels. Food intolerances and sensitivities allergies and you know and um, gluten and casein and things like that um, and just look at the list that once again recommended for testing around diseases GERD peptic ulcers celiac disease non-celiac disease gluten intolerances pica h pylori irritable bowel syndrome hormonal disturbances nerve damages Glutamate, excessive glutamate in the system, which really causes a lot of agitation, angers, and aggressions. And GABA, the, one of the major neurotransmitters that should be, should be bringing us to a, a softening of some of that drivenness, right? Gastrointestinal infections. I mean, virtually every piece of research says make sure you at least test for Clostridium and Candida. Dr. Derek McFave from the University of Western Ontario has done extensive work in his organization to make sure that we look at the what's contributing to a lot of agitation, angers, and aggressions through that. And then even something as simple as cortisol. And any one of these above serious disturbances can cause agitation, anger, and aggression, and other manifestations of tragic, unnecessary suffering. The vast majority of these conditions are treatable. In the absence of adequate testing and treatment, however, these biomedical comorbidities are typically somewhat managed, not treated with symptom sedating medications and behavior support plans. This approach is clearly not following the intentions of Quam, ONTABA, and the College of Family Physicians of Canada, the guideline directors, and the suggestions of, as I said, autism can and whatnot. So, I start with that concern. As a result, we have thousands of instances a week in Ontario of less than optimal support, including physical redirects, physical restraints, settles, which is basically solitary confinement, and even 911 calls where police generally use mechanical restraints and then sit for two hours in an emergency waiting room. And many, many, many of these instances are preventable, but we're not doing the full extent of testing, which I'm gonna to talk to you about through the PowerPoint we're gonna show you. And remember, as I said earlier, professionals who are not following these guidelines are good caring people. They are good caring people. And I'm hoping this morning that I'll be able to increase your skills as an advocate to be ensuring you're asking the right questions. And I'm gonna show you some of the questions that, that should be asked. Let me just put this in perspective a bit though. This is not uncommon in the human and health services fields, okay? Uh, a number of years ago, one of my all time heroes, uh, Dr. Alice Stewart. If you haven't heard of Alice Stewart, I'd encourage you to check into Alice. But she pulled together after several years of research, an impeccable study it was published in a recognized journal that showed that if doctors order x-rays on pregnant women, they will double the likelihood of childhood cancers. Now, that was received with great resistance from virtually all the professionals in the field and doctors and radiologists and all of that. Over the next couple of years, numerous other studies 
were brought that proved this outside of, of her domain, which I think was Oxford. The next five years, more and more studies came out. I'll shorten this story by sharing with you that good caring professionals, the Canadian government took 24 years before they made it illegal for a physician to be able to x-ray a woman who's pregnant. This was after thousands and thousands of deaths. I'm bringing this message to us because the research usually lags much longer than it needs to. And we're not talking about just kind of some little study here and there that's been done on 12 people. We're talking about a consensus of international research that for many years has been available to us. So what we're going to do when we look at, at um, our presentation this morning, I'm going to take you through showing you some of these comorbidities the kinds of testing that should be done to ensure that they're treated properly, and then some of the kinds of results that we can be looking at, okay? So um, with that, Jane, would you bring up our PowerPoint and let's just uh, work through that, okay? Sure. It's just one quick question, Peter. Um, you were talking about a number of items and Corrine has asked where we could get a copy of this list. Uh, I, will send, I will send that to you and you can, put it out to all of the uh, participants if you would. Yeah, that absolutely. Would it's, a part, it's a part of a, even a larger document where I've just gone into detail of what we're going to talk about this morning. So absolutely for sure. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I will pull up our screen. <clears throat> That's, that's great. That's great. Yes. So give us the next slide if you would then Jane. Let's just populate this slide completely. I'm just showing you where some of the sources of what you're going to hear are 3000 moms and dads and support professionals. Um, Dr. John Rady from Harvard. I did a lot of my training at Harvard um, through John Rady and Dr. Martha Herbert. Um, place called the Center for Discovery, New York State Center of Excellence for Autism Research. They spend like 150 million for 35 years to bring you some of the information I'm going to be bringing you. Martha Herbert, and who has really just been so helpful in my book and the work that we've done, uh, pediatric neurologist at, uh, at UMass and also at Harvard, Dr. Shinzen Young, and, um, and I'm on uh, an instructor at the University of Toronto, and Toronto has just contributed significantly as well. And uh, health sciences, there's just a lot of a lot of, uh, of folks have got this. At the end of this uh, PowerPoint, you're going to see I list uh, recommended reading uh, that includes a lot of the citations as well. So I'm not going to bog you down with heavy research references in this, but you'll see that uh, there's enough references to more than justify what we're talking about here. And indeed, there's many of you, I'm sure, have seen the results of, of dealing with these comorbidities and best practices as well. So give us the next slide then, if, would you, Jane? These are just some of the agencies we've worked with who've contributed to our work uh, through the last number of years. And um, just the next slide then, Jane. And the next slide, just an endorsement from Harvard. And then the next slide, which I wanna to talk to for a second. So populate that slide if you would. So our approach to supporting individuals, children, whoever with development of disabilities is it's got three major pieces to it. It's the knowledge and understanding of best practices, which is what we're, we're working with right now and I'm going to share with you. And then we look at the conscious and caring emotional self-regulation of we supporters. Uh, through the work that I've done and so literally training thousands of folks, I always ask the question, generally I always ask the question, uh, when we have incidents that are less than optimal moments, you know, when when a person we're supporting, you know, becomes anxious and angry or and even aggressive, self-injurious, how often would you say that you've contributed to that with your own being emotionally hijacked and getting into power struggles and enforcing silly rules and all that? And through hundreds and hundreds of people, 
I never get a number that's less than 50% in terms of us. So a very important part of our model, which we're going to talk about in the second half of this morning's presentation is care for the caregiver and really how to help us as caregivers, supporters, be more emotionally self-regulated, right? And then finally, there needs to be a, a way to deliver what we've learned and, and also the skill sets that we have. And we offer a competent services delivery process, which we'll talk about later on too. Next then, Jane. So I'll just populate that slide. So there's three basic groups of people, if I could be, you know, to just put it into, <clears throat> into a perspective, unmet complex needs with ongoing symptoms of agitation, anger, and aggression towards self and others. There's another population of complex needs marginally met, however, not living near their full potential. And then there is a, there is a, a good group of complex needs they're fully met and appears to be living to their fullest mind, body, and spiritual potential. So we're going to spend, <clears throat> certainly what we're going to talk about is applicable to all three. Many of the examples are going to be for uh, and two above, okay? Just to let you know the context we're giving here. Next slide, Jane. So this is, this is one slide. This was a, a really landmark study, 10 years old now, where um major researcher programmer at harvard uh, published this it was published in a recognized journal that basically said that the behaviors that we see with folks with autism and other development disabilities there's no evidence to support that's coming directly from the diagnosis of autism or the development of disability but as you'll see further on it goes into looking at medical conditions and these comorbidities that we're talking about. it's going to give a few of these next then jane and on TABA, on TABA, I've just really led for, for, for years in terms of recognizing the need to deal with comorbidities, particularly in January 2019. It was a landmark study done by their, their task force that they put out um, basically the, the task force, this evidence based practices for the treatment of challenging behaviors, intellectual disabilities. You can look at that study if you like, but give us the next slide then, Jane. I'll just mention in that slide that they actually discuss, these are quotes from the study, all individuals who engage in challenging behavior should receive a medical assessment to rule out the possibility that behavior is occurring due to underlying medical condition. But on to say the Canadian consensus guidelines, which I was referring to in my earlier talk, for the primary care of adults with intellectual disabilities, provide a comprehensive set of recommendations. And that's the 31 plus suggestions that family physicians should be looking at when we're presenting, you know, with, for them to be supporting someone with autism or development disabilities. And then finally, these guidelines also identify a number of common medical issues that may contribute to the onset of challenging behaviors. Although we're talking challenging behaviors here, for me, when I see this and read the literature, this doesn't just mean angers and aggression that also means that people are not realizing their fullest potential their sense of well-being is compromised so next then jane so these are just quotes from the from the uh report you can read them you know when you want but basically the second one there the bio behavior model of challenging behavior indicates that both biological and environmental factors must be considered during assessment addressed and treatment once again, I ask you to look at behavior support plans that you are, are currently aware of and just see what biomedical comorbidities test, testing and treatment is happening. Um, you'll be, I think, quite surprised when you see that there could be so much more done here. Next, Jane. And BCBAs have certainly have said that for years that we have to be looking at the, the, the biological as, as well as the, the uh, behavioral. Next. Dr. Tristan Hamlin, who <clears throat> has also done a lot of work to help me in the work that I'm doing in Ontario. Um, she is executive director at the Center for Discovery. And like I said, this is a major New York State Center of Excellence and just more research from, from them. I'm just building the case here that this is just not some fad that that I've you know come across with a few people that I've worked with. This is extensive research. Next, Jane. So just understand a, a little bit, and we'll unpack this a little bit more, but start thinking, if you would, as you go through this presentation with me, that to understand the, the cycle of how uh, unmet needs 
will in all of us create anxiety and pain. This is the nature of how we are wired, right? Emotional or physical pain as a result of unmet needs. And that, <clears throat> that anxiety and pain, we've been wired, if you will, to through anger, agitation, and even aggressions to deal with that, with those anxieties. It's, a, it's the way the human system works. And uh, we'll go into a bit later in terms of why it's like that. But most important, just understand that whenever you have an unmet need, emotional or physical, you will have anxiety. And for each of us, it's the same way as well as for the people we're supporting. And it's not uncommon. You'll find yourself struggling with even in your own lives let's say you have a, an emotional concern you're worried about something how you if you notice how you become impatient and just not the person that you normally would be um, that's a part of this same system that, that really causes less than optimal well-being up to and including self-injury and aggression with people who have unmet needs i'm just trying to make the point so clear that unless we get really, really clear identification and treatment of these biomedical comorbidities, what we're doing downstream, even in terms of good, good behavioral interventions, the likes of that, it's inadequate. We must go back upstream and start dealing with the more fundamental causes, right? Next, Jane, if you would. And uh, I just like this quote because it reminds us and settles us into really what we're looking at here. A counterfeit peace exists when people supported are pacified, distracted, frightened, or so tired of fighting that all appears to others to be calm. I'm sure that many of you will relate to, to that. And just let's just keep that front and center in our minds. Compliance does not mean we're meeting people's needs, right? Compliance due to fear, compliance due to being tired, worn out, that doesn't mean that we've met the needs. And uh, sadly, in a lot of situations that I've been involved, we see that happening. Once again, not out of any malice or uncaring, uh, not that at all. There's other reasons for it. Next, Jane. So these are, this is just a, a little summary of the main comorbidities that the, the literature talks about and that are talked about in the, in the census guidelines under the GI system, <clears throat> in infections, intolerances, imbalances, and physical pain, uh, mental and neurological, which many of you be familiar with, with seizures and mood disorders, brain imbalances, inflammation. Oh my gosh, you know, we'll talk a little bit about inflammation a little bit further in these imbalances, but lack of brain coherence, uh, underdevelopment, certainly more applying problems, these call into, and these are all comorbidities, once again, we identified and many, many treated well. You're likely most familiar with the sensory integration and processing issues. The human energy system, I'm going to unpack all of this for you as we roll through this, this time together, uh, looking at human energy and some of the cell problems that we've got. Emotional fears and phobias are involved in this, and then even looking at the adrenal glands, the overproduction of cortisol. These are, these are some of the main issues that I've found in my practice that when we deal with these effectively through proper nutrition, through, you know, certainly diet, through, through the various sensory um, processing uh, treatments, uh, even good behavioral support plans can teach an awful lot. This is the one thing about behavioral support plans. I'm very, very strong on the great work that these professionals offer when they follow the guidelines as recommended by Untaba, which says, let's deal with these comorbidities, but there is just um, irreplaceable skill sets to, with good behavioral plans once we've taken care of the full picture and the upstream concerns, right? Next, if you would, Jane. <clears throat> and this all just, just summarizes this, that, and then populate the second half of that, Jane. Once we are looking at these, these areas, once we get regulation in these areas, uh, things plummet in terms of, of, of uh, self-injury, um, even just depressions and things, you know, that manifestations of people lack of well-being, they plummet when these things are taken care of. This is what the research shows, and this is what, you know, you're going to see if, if you look into the international research as I have. Next, Jane. And just have to bring in a quote from Temple Grandin. Um, she recognizes that fear is one of the greatest, anxiety is one of the greatest concerns that we have to deal with. And that, of course, is coming very often from these comorbidities that we talk about. Next. 
this is an interesting quote for you. Many people, when I ask them, uh, so you have someone who is struggling with well-being sometime, and they they just seem to erupt almost like within a minute, they, something happens and they explode. They go from zero to 60 miles an hour, and it seems like in a minute or so. And um, when I was trained in this with, uh, with John Rady, Dr. Rady, he said that very seldom happens, very seldom happens. He says most of the time, people are sitting at 55 miles an hour, and something happens and they move to 60. What we look at in terms of a lot of the work we do is dealing with that 55 miles an hour, bringing it down to 45, 35, and hopefully down be less than 10. That's what some of this presentation is about for sure. Next, Jane. So this is a, just a summary of, of um, how we start looking at it. We've got these comorbidities on the left. Just pop, populate that slide then, Jane. And it contributes significantly to the functional goals, brain dysregulation, physical pain and discomfort, the emotional pain, anxiety we talked about, contributes to those problems. And from those problems, we will get either blowout, which we're you know, you have seen through agitations and self-injury and the likes of that, or the blow-ins. And often we don't appreciate enough the problems with blow-ins. People get withdrawn and compliant and depressed, and we think they're calm, but they're not. And that's why cortisol readings are really important to know where someone is at in terms of their anxiety. Just looking at someone, you cannot tell if they're having a major blow-in, which is a response to a comorbidities issue, or, or, or whether they are relatively calm. So there's ways to know that, right? And then finally, populate the rest of that then, Jane. So if we only use behavioral interventions without the primary bio, biological, biomedical care is recommended, then we're going to have recurring cycles this over and over and over. So what we're about today and the work that we do is to eliminate this recycling of the problem. Next, Jane. And just uh, repeat, repeat, repeat the work of ABA and IBI, excellent, provided that we follow the behavior analyst board standards, right? Next, Jane. Successful prevention. This is really important. The majority of unmet regulatory causes, these comorbidities for lack of well-being, self-injury, and aggression can be successfully prevented and treated however, with only a much more biopsychosocial process. You'll hear many people say, oh yeah, we, we follow a biopsychosocial model, we're good. Well, you have to ask and tell me what you mean by that. What do you mean by dealing with the biological indicators? And you'll see, yeah, we've got some minimal testing done, the likes of that. We'll get into that a little bit later, but when someone says, yeah, we support the biopsychosocial model, always ask, and what does that mean? Next, Jane. So this is the model we're looking at. We think, generally speaking, in the province, there's some good work being done at the medical level for what the medical folks are, are skilled at doing. Um, and I'm just going to stop for a moment at medical, medical area. Yes, excellent work is being done in the medical area. The problem is, and this is something to do with the sector, if in all due respect to the ministry and Quam, they put the, the responsibility for nutritional issues, this whole system of, of naturopathic medicine and medical, they, they put it all under medical doctors. And I can only speak for the dozens of doctors that I've worked with and the ones that will confide with me in private. And if you start asking these questions, you get to know a doctor, you'll say, well, doctor, why is it that the family physician's guidelines show we, we should be looking at these infections and H. pylori and all these things we should be looking at? Why is it that when I look at the testing that you do in your, when someone comes in for service, I see about, you know, uh, vitamin D is checked for and B12 is checked for and maybe iron um, and maybe, you know, and like, like 10, 15 percent of what needs to be tested is there. And on, on the quiet, they'll say to me, we don't really have expertise when it looks at the full range of what's happening in that biological system from a nutritional and from a growth perspective. They're just excellent at working in diseases. And my gosh, we just so value them. But we need to start to bring in registered nutritionists a lot more, and naturopathic doctors. We need doctoral level people 
working with us on nutrition, just as we need doctor level people working with us on mental health disorders and disease components. But we put them all under one profession. And this profession acknowledges in private, this acknowledges that the reason they don't order a lot of testing because they don't really understand the results that well. And it's much more than just saying, oh, yeah, the, the average healthy person should have so much vitamin B12 on this scale. And if they hit there, they're fine. No, there's so much more to nutrition, which we can't go into today, but you don't have to look too far in the literature to see that that registered nutritionists and doctoral, doctoral level folks who are working naturopathic dogs, why not? Good ones. I mean, there's every profession has got their limitations and their and their great gifted people. But when we get the proper qualifications and dedication in these professions, and each person's doing what they need to be doing, it makes a difference. Behavioralism is doing a great job, and a lot of safety work and the likes of that. And when they are responsible, and many behavioralists are, by the way, I've read many behavioral support plans that are saying, yes, here's what I needed in testing, and here's what I got done. And I noticed because we had, you know, an imbalance of zinc and copper, we took care of that, and gosh, behaviors changed. So we have good behaviorists that are following the guidelines of UNTAB in terms of looking at these comorbidities. So please don't hear me making a big broad brush against all of it. But we're just saying that we have to increase and close the gap in some others. And the work we're doing in you know, some of the social value role, I mean, the, our sector is outstanding, I think, and a lot of the work we're doing, COVID has kind of compromised us in some of these areas, but we really have done a great job in looking at social value role and likes of that always could be better, of course. But what we try to bring through conscious care and support is as a greater recognition for the need for looking at these biomedical comorbidities, you can just populate the bottom part of that, Jane, if you would, and then looking at mind for emotional self regulation, and also looking at this competent services. So that's the, that's the bigger model that we ask folks to look at. And next, Jane, if you would. Just populate this whole slide. We've got the comorbidities saying that <clears throat> we can get less and less physical pain, less and less, and we can get more regulated systems if we look at a model such as we're looking at. So next then, Jane. <clears throat> so I, I just asked this question. We're not going to you know, take time, but what percentage of people supported who have unmet complex needs supported and treated as recommended by these groups? And why might that be? I just put that out as a, as a question for you to answer. We must be answering that question in each of our roles and whoever we're responsible for when we are supporting folks, right? So just put that out and let that linger for a bit. Jane, next, next slide, if you would. And I thank you to Dr. Al Stewart for reminding us that good caring people can have a resistance to bringing in the research. And in some cases it's well-founded because you have to have research that goes across a broad, section of, of research institutions, a broad section must be peer reviewed, must be published in the top journals. There's many journals that are not not top. But when you get the, you know, the Mayo's, the Harvard's, the, you know, the Western the University of Western Ontario, when you get publications coming from there, you know, you've got, you know, really good peer reviewed work. That's what we're building our case on here today. So uh, next slide, if you would, then so um, just um, if you just move ahead, Jane, to a couple of slides, I'm going to just pick up on the GI system. Let's go through, as Jane's doing this, and just when you come to the, just hold it there if you would, Jane. So one dimension that we talked to in terms of we as supporters, we need to help the people we're supporting develop that part of the brain on the previous slide. We had that green, the green dot. Maybe just show that, Jane, come back to that one if you would. And, and this is the medial frontal cortex. And this part of the brain is what gives us a lot of our empathy, a lot of our, just go back to the, to the slide of the, the brain, if you would, Jane. This, this medial prefrontal cortex is responsible for, for regulating the, the, um, the medial prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for cooperation, um, uh, our, our ability to just want to connect with people. Go to the next slide, if you would, then, Jane, and we'll just list those. These are all the things that this part of the brain are responsible for. Tune communications, emotional balance, empathy, all of these. And guess what? 
we can train people. There's no evidence, no evidence to say that people we support cannot develop that part of their brain, which is a direct regulation of the amygdala, which you saw on your slide. So it's really important. And we're going to show you after break today, the number one way to develop this is through something called mindfulness. It's the number one skill set that when we teach people to be mindful, we can enhance this part of the brain, which has got great regulation on the amygdala, which of course is the firing pin for you know, fear, you know, flight and the rest of that. Next slide then, Jane. So I'm just going to kind of pause and just share a little bit here in terms of some specifics. I'm now going to get you to uh, imagine listening to a person you're supporting, a child or an adult, and they're talking to you in the first person. I'm just going to give you 10 of these. And at the end of the PowerPoint, I've listed a lot more for you. But these are some of the things that come up that I see time and time and time again, that where we as good supporters are sometimes missing. So here I am, a person with a development disability. And on the right, I'm asking you to do something about it. I am a 10 second person living in a one second world. I'm asking you to please slow down your communications and wait for my response. If we are communicating with someone with a development ability and we are jumping in before 10 seconds, we are not honoring that person's communication skills. And this does not have to do with the disability. They just take a little bit longer to process data. It's not an intelligence thing at this level. Processing data just takes a bit more time and we must really honor that. Number two, I hate not knowing my time limits. I really need to know timelines. Stay committed to establish timelines with me when we are going to the park and warn me when things change, right? I really like a timer. Let me set my own timer. Just things like that to let people stay in charge, right? Number three, I hate too many choices. Too many choices confuse me. Ask me this or that, first this and that. I think you know some of these, but they're really important that you take them. Because if we're not doing this right, then even the comorbidities, you know, cleaning up comorbidities are not going to help. Next slide then, Jane. So an environment that gives me too much overload, sensory, cognitive, whatever, makes me anxious. Learn my sensory needs and support me accordingly. Number five, when I start to get anxious, please stop making it worse by becoming logical. I now need your empathy and validation. Help me with calming exercises, which we'll talk about in a minute. Number six, there's a 50% chance that I have PTSD syndrome. Please stop triggering me with a loud voice and shouting. The number one way to activate PTSD triggers is through raising the sound level, right? Next, Jane. I hate changes. I fear the unknown, right? Stay on schedule as much as you possibly can and let me know when you have to change things. When you tell me about the change, expect me to react. But what if... I am nonverbal. I will still be thinking, but what if? So always try to say, and if this happens, tell me what's going to happen. I just need to be kept informed, right? We still take these for granted sometimes, particularly with people that do not communicate verbally, right? I mean, I'm highly sensitive to your reactions and need to know and feel that I have not upset you. Please work to stay emotionally self-regulated and tell me if something is bothering you. Next, Jane. I have nine meanings for the word no. That's just an arbitrary number, but there are many. We ask supporters, mom, dads, to get to know what some of these are. When I say no, remember, it can mean any of the following. I'm afraid of doing it wrong. I don't want to look bad. I'm not ready yet. I'm not sure what to do. I want more information. Ask me later, again or tomorrow. I'm afraid to do it, you ask. Give me better reasons to do it. I'm in pain. Please help me. So we just take no as no, they're not interested. Look beyond the no to see what the real message is, right? And finally, I have many reasons for not wanting to be around people. One big reason is that most people like to be spontaneous, and I hate it. As much as possible, let me do it my way if plans change. Also, let me do repetitive behavior because it's my way of calming down when things go off schedule. So that's just a little reminder that although we're talking about these comorbidities, which we're going to get into now, I want you to know that we've got some work to do in terms of just social interactions. And I've got another 15 of these at the end of the PowerPoint if we have time to go through them. Next, Gene. 
So I'm going to talk to you about, um, just go through a, a number of slides, Jane. I'm going to do, then just talk to these, okay? Just advance next and next and next. Hold it there, okay? So what we've just gone through in terms of those, those uh, previous slides is some calming strategies. And we don't have a lot of time, but I'm just going to give you a couple little calming strategies, and we can all do this. There's, we teach something called the butterfly hug. This is based on some pretty good neuroscience itself. This is a bilateral stimulation, which is now balancing chemists in the brain. When we rock, when we rock a baby, um, when we do repetitive behavior some of it, we put stimulation into different parts of the brain, either sides of the brain. And when we have more, more activation, and in a balanced sense in the brain, we go into calming. So this is simulating rocking. This is getting the person into really for themselves. They can just do this themselves. And we've taught this to literally hundreds of people who can calm themselves just like this. And you'll see them start to even do it without being prompted, right? And then there's, there's a couple of pressure points that we on the website, which is, by the way, all free download. You've got the references there, centerforconsciouscare.ca. Every, all of this is in more detail. All of these instructions are there. Uh, and they say there's, it's all free download for you, okay? But right here, thereabouts, is a couple of meridian points that are real calming meridian points. We just teach people how to, how to activate those. And then the same with activating in the hand. So you'll see those on the site. But just to let you know, these are just little things that you can do just to calm. This is not the comorbidities, which we're going to get into. But this is really, really important just to know that there's a generalized calming that can take place. Uh, while we're working towards, you know, taking care of the, the comorbidities. So uh, the next slide then, Jane, if you would. 93% of children with autism have one or more co-occurring condition. This is Autism Speaks. And this, by the way, is, is the numbers higher than most, but 80% and more. We know we have GI problems. And so therefore not to be doing the testing that I outlined earlier, even though there's not the systems not adequate, we must do the testing when we know that when we're looking at someone with a development disability, particularly autism here, we know that there's going to be GI issues, infections, imbalances, intolerances. And to not be testing these out of the gate, get baseline on this is just, is just inadequate. It's some of the incompleteness that I shared with you earlier. Next slide, Jane. <clears throat> this is some of the work of great Derek Fabe. Look up his work, if you would, on, on the website. Just populate that slide, Jane, and, and move on. But Dr. Fabe talks about, once again, the gut, and he looks at clostridia. Um, look at, if you will, go to uh, YouTube, I think, uh, the Autism Enigma. It's a David Suzuki nature of things. And he talks about Dr. McFabe's work. Dr. McFabe contributed to my work in my book, looking at this gut infections. And I would say for when we have, when we have people, kids and people that have um, agitations, even up to including self-injury and aggressions, and we have either medical doctors testing or through naturopathic doctors testing for infections, we very often find candida and clostridium. And it's really powerful. You watch that video I just referenced to you from, from David Suzuki, and you'll see why we must get a handle on gut infections if we ever hope to help people be all they can be, right? Next. And just uh, that was just autism speaks again, eight times more likely to suffer from chronic gastrointestinal disorders, eight times. And this is what the Center for Discovery, Harvard, no matter where you go, male, they find all these, these same stats. So if you've got that type of likelihood and you're looking at someone's receiving medical care and we haven't been testing for some of these disorders. And typically when we bring someone as an advocate to a doctor, and they've got, let's say, constipation or diarrhea. Typically, what happens there? Does the general practitioner then say, oh, my gosh, we're going to do a battery of tests to see what infections could be happening? What's wrong with the gut? What's wrong with the nutrition? Typically not. Typically, when I look at these files, I say immediate writing a prescription for a pharmaceutical laxative or something. Like, I don't think my experience is rare. Must you some of you must be seeing this, 
And we are, we are treating symptoms when we're getting incredible indicators that we've got some of these problems at eight times. And until we deal with these really infections and what's there, the imbalances and whatnot, we're going to struggle with some of the other great things that we're doing. Next slide, if you would, Jane. And here we just talk about, um, once again, this is some of the work of Dr. Derek McFabes. I won't go into this too much, but he does point out that um, when he takes, so here's some of the work he's done. He's done extensive work in Clostridia. This is bacteria that's in the gut. By the way, children with autism have, have significantly higher levels of Clostridia in terms of the actual number of strains in the gut as, as typical children. Now, what he does is when you get this clostridium, and it's for a number of reasons, one of them is excess sugar, others antibiotics, there's a number of reasons as to why clostridia grows, and it, it populates into something called PPA, propionic acid. And when he takes propionic acid from the stool samples of kids and adults with autism, he takes the PPA and puts it into the food of healthy rodents, they show almost within hours start to show several of the signs of autism. Pulls that food back, changes the food back to normal, and they come back to not showing those signs. Just, you need to read McFabe's work to appreciate some of what this gut brain tie-in is, is all about. Next slide, if you would, Jane. And then just, yeah, I mean, excess of cortisol in the system. When people are anxious, they have high levels of cortisol in the system. It's, that's the free fight or flight, you know, hormone. And when the brain is dealing with cortisol, it will steal amino acids that were supposed to go into digesting food, building immunes and producing calming neurotransmitters. It steals it to, to fight with this toxic called cortisol. We need some cortisol, but too much is toxic. So the brain will sacrifice digesting and immunes and, and even building calming neurotransmitters to neutralize the cortisol. If you don't know what the cortisol level of the person you're supporting is, who's, who's let's say having, you know, I'm not talking about that third level where we got people with, seem to have their, their complex needs taken care of, and they really are really showing that they're meeting their mind, body, and spiritual potential. I'm not talking here so much there. I'm saying if you see people that are demonstrating issues around self injury or some just just not, you know, happy, we need to start looking at these kind of these biomedical comorbidities, right? Next slide, then Jane. This is just a summary of where to go. We've just talked about this, the, you know, the testing through good naturopathic doctors and nutritionists, certainly MDs, there are some MDs, we've worked with some incredible medical doctors who do all of this, they'll say to us, so what do you want me to test and they're just open up and they go for it, right? It has to be an MD that's available and qualified to do this. And we need to ask an MD, doctor, do you have the qualifications to be looking at the really in-depth complex nature of nutrition that my child needs? Are we, these are reasonable questions to ask. Well, doctor, could you refer me to someone who could? Right? I mean, Quam, everyone talks about good nutrition and dietitian. If we're talking about the importance of nutrition and dietitian, that doesn't mean the can of food guide for everybody. Some people need to have much clearer assessments of what their needs are. Why not go to a doctoral level, a graduate level person that's trained in this, registered nutritionist, naturopathic doctors, whatever. So that's just what we're advocating here. We want to look for these balances. Um, once again, this is why I say it's a won't problem because all this technology is available. It's been available for years, reliably available. But we're not doing it. There's reasons as to why we're not doing, but it's not because it's not available. And in many cases, it can be treated as well. Next slide, if you would. <clears throat> so once again, I just asked the question, report some thousand, a thousand parents that you know, I've worked with, you know, what percent of gastrointestinal needs are adequately assessed and treated as required by the college or any place else you want to go? I'm just saying that I see it as being more incomplete than it should be. Next, Jane. 
myofunctional health, of course, is very important. The dental, I won't spend time on that today, but really important. Those are 10 things you can look for as a supporter to see if your child has got myofunctional or dental needs that could be causing their, them to not be all that they can be. Just 10 obvious ones we, we listed there, right? More of that in the book, of course, and, and on the website. Next, Jane. When we look at emotional health, we won't take a lot of time here, just we must ensure. I, I say that there's a lot of, lot of times that certain medications are being given by, by doctors and it's not turning out to me where it is, but I, I quickly say, often that's the supporters problem, not the doctors, because we are not bringing adequate documentation to primary care physicians to be making some of these judgments. We want to be, and on the, on the website, we've got tracking tools. We just take two weeks and just, you know, check, check, check what's happening. When you're asked, the doctor says, you know, how they, how's it going with so-and-so? You can then present documentation that shows this is how it's going. Not, oh, well, I think they're a bit more agitated and they're not sleeping quite as well, I don't think. No, we don't want to have any of that. This is vitally important to the person's being that we bring in documentation. Those are the two big things in terms of helping primary care physicians to do what they need to do. And the second one is making sure that that checklist is not contaminated with our problems. How many times I've, I've seen people who I've worked with in an advocacy role where the supporters, there's one or two supporters maybe in this person's life uh, who are struggling with mindful emotional self-regulation. And therefore they're contributing to over half of the items that are on the checklist to show when there were behavioral instances. I mean, that data, often that data is like wrong half the time. And just to be handing that data these ABC checklists, handing that to a behavioralist, handing it to a doctor and say, well, here's what's happening, doctor, go and, you know, decide what you're going to do here. The behavioralist decide on a program. It's not good enough because if that data is contaminated by our own, our own behaviors, then the decisions are being made with very inadequate data. We have to be really particular about the data we give our professionals so that the great skills and caring that they have can manifest more clearly as compared to just generalizations, right? Next, I'm sorry, just at this time, you know, I'm just aware of, of, I'm hitting pretty hard here. We've got an hour and a half. I'm trying to give you so much. Please continue to hear my respect for my colleagues in the field. And, and they just these so many, so many great, you know, doctors and behavioralists that are doing great work and OTs and support professionals and moms and dads. I'm just trying to really, in this time, get you motivated to take the next step you need to take to close these gaps. And I know it's not gonna happen if I just kind of just, you know, casually, oh yeah, maybe it'd be nice, maybe it wouldn't. No, no, it's not the way I work because there's so much importance needs to be put on this, right? So <clears throat> understand some of when we're asking, when we see a medication giving doctor, how will I know if this is effective or not? Doctor, how will I know if this is acceptable side effects? <clears throat> no one should be leaving as an advocate a doctor's appointment for a medication without getting at least five or 10 minutes on what to expect, right? Like this is our responsibility as advocates. And once again, we can do this. This is why I keep saying it. We're not doing it. It's more of we're just not doing it. Not that we don't know how. Next. And then look at uh, brain development and, and coherence. The next slide, if you would. <clears throat> Dr. Martha Herbert, just look at her quote. She's, she's been so helpful for me in the work I'm doing. She's, as I said, pediatric neurologist. She's written a couple of great books. Over time, I gathered more and more evidence to support the idea that autism is not about having a broken brain, but about having a brain that is having a hard time regulating itself. That is so insightful. She's got research to back this up. On my website, there's a four-page paper that she's written with over a hundred citations to back up where she's going with this. She's been so helpful for me personally. I'm a phone call away from Dr. Herbert. Insomnia, pesticides, no, new, poor nutrition, low zinc, magnesium, other nutrients, sugar additives, rather junk food, gut inflammation, irritability, right? EF, EMFs and RF and RFR is gonna talk about them in a second, what they do to the electrical function of the body. 
yeah, this is just a little example of what Dr. Martha Herbert is looking at. Once again, a lot of these things I've talked about in the presentation so far don't cost a lot of money. The testing doesn't cost a lot. In many cases, even the treatment doesn't cost a lot. It's, it's not in the main a money problem. Next. So and I just have to stop on the slide for a moment. See that MRI on the right? That's your brain right now. If you're normal and understanding what I'm saying, and hopefully you are from my job, um, your brain is functioning at about 25 hertz per second. It oscillates 25 times a second. And when you went to sleep last night, it oscillated about six times a second. That's the way the brain works. The brain is, see, what we are, these, these beautiful spiritual beings, that's who we are. But what we are is electromagnetic energy. And we follow the laws of energy in many, many ways, these bodies of ours, right? Every chemical you've got in your body has got a, a system of electrical movement to, to make it work. On the left is your brain when you just got up this morning. About 11 or 12 hertz is what's happening in the brain on the left, okay? So <clears throat> just imagine when you just woke up this morning. You know that the numbers vary, but let's say I average 25% of people who are struggling with, with self-injury behavior and even you know, agitations, 25% of those people, their brain never naturally gets above 12 to 14 hertz. It never naturally gets above that. It's a part of the, the disability, unless two things happen. One, unless they aggress, argumentative, aggress, even, even hurt themselves. Then I guess flips into this, you know, amygdala ramps it up to be ready for fight or flight, and it gets the hertz. When I go into agencies, I ask to see, give me a listing of, of the time when you know, this person's uh, behavioral, behavioral incidents took place, the time that you know, like we get a history, right? Very often, you'll see half of the times are like from 7 to 9 in the morning. And this isn't just one quote that go into program because it happens on the weekends as well. They are self-medicating to wake up. The good news is 10 to 15 minutes bouncing and balancing, sitting on an elliptical cushion, being on a mini trampoline, whatever, 15 minutes, and their brain goes into where our brain is now. Uh, how many incidents in Ontario will be reported this year in the thousands of people who, if they had been given sing or balancing, they woke up. They would not have had that incident. And we can, we can show you this. People are reporting this. Well, it's just, yeah, I mean, the research is there. Next, if you give us the next slide, then, Jane. <clears throat> and um, but that's just some, some references. Once again, I just every so often dump in some references about where to look for this, for this stuff, okay? But it's just showing you that we've got the po power to be able to regulate as many, much as we're doing. Next, Jane. Next, I just put this in. This is not a brain of a child who's got autism, but I just so was encouraged when I saw this, this uh, slide many years ago. This uh, little girl named Cameron Mott, when, her, <clears throat> when she was age four, doctors came to her parents and said, uh, Cameron's got seizures so bad that she likely will you know, not have a life, really anything. She may even die because of the injuries that could come to her because of seizures. They did the corpus callosum cutting. They did all the seizure kinds of, of operations, but to no avail. So they said to her, we're going to suggest we take out half her brain. Half her brain, they said, taking it, which they did. That's an MRI of her brain after the surgery. Look at the results of what happened with her. She, this was 16, 17 years ago. Aside from some weakening on one side of her body, she is indistinguishable from her classmates. She is a good student and participates in sports. This young gal's got half a brain. Now, the brain, the research on brain development and regeneration, neurogenesis, all of the research has been done on how the brain can heal itself, how it even knows to heal itself. A part of the brain is, is in trouble, and another part of the brain will, will pick up the slack. This is the way our brain works. It's so adaptable. I say to, to parents and supporters of people, we must continue to 
as a part of all our daily interactions, be doing things like mindfulness and activities to grow the parts of the brain because the adapting and the growth of brain cells is very much the same potential for, for us and for people with development disabilities. It's, it's, I mean, it's all relative. We're not saying we're going to try to make them neurotypical. We're just saying let's give people full potential to grow and adapt in terms of this brain as best they can because the research is just so overwhelming on how adaptable the brain can be for even like stroke victims that we know of. I mean, it's just so, so encouraging, so encouraging. Next. <clears throat> so no evidence suggests that the brain, you know, people who are supporting cannot, cannot grow uh, and heal and develop it and with different types of training and conditions. Next one then, Jane. So just some of the things that we can do, just look at this slide at your leisure, but it's a big one. Enhance essential brain calming elements, GAB and serotonin, the two big calming neurotransmitters. Prevent excessive excitatory elements, cortisol, glutamate. Glutamate, ah, let me take one minute on glutamate. You heard of, of uh, monosodium glutamate, MSG. Uh, glutamate, for each of you, who maybe lost your car just recently and you're frantically looking around, where are they, what are they, and then you found them? Well, what you had just had when you were frantic, you had a hit of glutamate. Your brain had produced this, this excitatory substance, glutamate. But because you've got a healthy brain with glial cells went in like a vacuum and just sucked up all this excess glutamate. And you were back to a minute or two minutes, you're likely, you know, kind of complaining about your partner who, hid them on you or left them someplace, but you were calm. Well, many people who we support <clears throat> have excess of glutamate because they do not have a healthy functioning glial cell system. They do not have what we have. And it's bad enough just with when they get excited and they take a while to kind of calm down much, much longer than a neurotypical brain would, but it's worse than that. MSG, the G in that is for glutamate. And MSG is in how much fast foods. There's over 52 names for MSG now, apparently. And it's in a lot of fast foods because it's a preservative and the likes of that. So every time we feed a kid, you know, something or an adult, some food that's got MSG in it, we are really encouraging them to get overly excited up to and including even extremes. So just hear that, check, get with the nutritionist, see what really intolerances are out there. If you just got the five big ones taken care of, the quality of life really enhances, right? Three, balance anxiety producing some of these, these various vitamins and minerals. Each of these have got a serious function in terms of a calming, calming strategies. And then the cerebellum activation. We have a cerebellum, a big part of our brain back here. And often um, we do not have it activated sufficiently in the brains of folks with, with autism development disabilities. And so it has to be activated through bouncing and bouncing. And when it does, we can get something called brain coherence, which means our sense stores can talk to each other much better. And I'm just giving you the short version of this, hopefully, hopefully motivating you to go to the site and do whatever you can to kind of get more information on this. But just knowing we need to have bouncing and balancing in our life. Um, people reporting, if they're not having some type of bouncing and balancing, there's really a serious problem. Number five, maintain adequate glutathione levels to prevent brain inflammation. I mentioned that study earlier on the NAC, 72% improvement in that checklist, in the, in the aberrant behavioral checklist, just from a therapeutic level of NAC. It's, it's just, we, we know about the brain in these certain areas. Uh, I mean, there's a lot we don't know and there's a lot we're going to discover. I'm telling you, kind of really, you don't have to look too far to see the stuff that I'm talking about if you start looking for it. And when was the last time you had, you know, glutathione checked by a doctor? Like, I'll bet you there's not one person listening right now that, that there, was a, there was just a, a check down on glutathione, which can be done for, for not that much money at all through the organic acid test. Um, and please know that for the testing that we've had done and the people that we've worked with over the last 10 years, I would say 
almost half of the tests come back showing low levels of glutathione. And just look into just your basic, go to, go to uh, Google and just Google, what is the function of glutathione? It's gonna blow your mind in terms of calming and everything else it's designed to do. Yeah, anyway, next. Mitochondria, this is the, every, every cell has got an engine, it's called the mitochondria. It's the powerhouse of the cell. Every cell that wants to function needs to have mitochondria alive and well, right? It's called a methylation process when, when, when this, this mitochondria are active, right? What kills the mitochondria process? Top of my list, simple carbs and sugar. Oxidative stress causing brain inflammation. Low glutathione. Medications such as antibiotics and antipsychotics vitamins and mineral imbalances, low Bs, low folic acid, magnesium Ds. These kill the cells, brain cells and other body cells that we need, they don't kill the cells, but they slow down the mitochondria functioning. Um, these, these fixes are not you know, complex, right? But there's a fair bit, I know. Okay, uh, next, if you would, Jane. We've done enough, I think, on cardio and whatnot to just go through these, these, that slide. That's a great little rebounder there, but human energy system, I'll just touch on this to populate the next slide then, Jane, if you would. Um, this is from Martha Herbert. Um, she was on a major international committee that looked at the effects of dirty electricity and what's happening through our radiation and the cell phones that we use. The radio wave frequency is what our cell phones work on, Wi-Fi, and EMF is the electromagnetic fields that are coming out of your 110 outlets. Uh, I'm not going into today, but check it out. You're going to see that the vast majority of people that know what they're talking about in this field will say that these electromagnetic systems that have been evolving for millions of years you think not getting impacted by electric currents that are going through the through the air and they're showing through kinesiology testing, they're showing some really concerning dropping in, in our abilities and these bodies of ours to be able to maintain health and many other implications as a result of that when we overexpose the EMF and uh, radio wave frequency. So just to put that up there, these are things you can all check. Once again, the site's got more details on all this and it's all free. Next, if you would, Jane. These are just some testing and some filters. Uh, believe it or not, these filters cost $25 each that you're looking at there. You can, even a child or an adult's bedroom, um, plug them in and it drops the negative impact from MF out of those circuits, drops it by 80 to 90% these green wave filters. And uh, once again, you can check, check all that out too. Next, if you would, Jane. Sensory integration. Um, here, just look at this. It ranges from the research that I've been able to get and see, but let's say roughly 70, 75% of people who we're supporting have got sensory processing uh, um, concerns. So, the need to get testing done by a good occupational therapist that knows what they're doing in this area. Remember, I can, the number I'm not sure if I'm gonna say one in five, but maybe one in five, maybe a best two in five of occupational therapists are really trained in sensory processing. The other occupational therapists are excellent in what they do, but they not necessarily going to do what you need in terms of sensory identification needs and treatment for, for the person that you're supporting. So make sure the OT you're using is qualified here. And don't just settle for like an assessment and a report kind of coming out, oh, this is the problems. You wanna work with an OT that's going to commit to not only do a good assessment, but to pre prescribe a treatment plan that you as supporters can implement. You don't need to be running back to an OT to implement. I mean, some places where you definitely want the professionals continue to implement, but we want someone who's gonna train us to be bringing in these processing um, ways of dealing with the, you know, the, the, the seven big sense doors that are, that are having problems. So, but look at, look at the prevalence. Can you imagine that any one of us had the like 75% likelihood of a serious concern in something, us not having that addressed? Like 
ASAP. Yeah. Next, if you would, please, Jane. So because research indicates that there is 80% likelihood that individuals with ASDD have sensory processing and integration challenges that cause and are greatly influencing anxiety, and for some aggression, CCC advocates for screening assessment and treatments by qualified occupations. I have to say this at the bottom of the slide. This treatment does not generally appear to be the case for many people supported throughout Ontario. I look at behavior support plans again, and I just keep looking and say, okay, now, where does it show here that we've really had an excellent assessment for sensory integration and programming issues? And how's the treatment going? I'll flip through some of those plans, and I just don't see it. But on tab is saying that it should be happening as well as the other comorbidities we're talking about. I just, I know I'm being very direct today, but I've only got you for a short while, so I just, I just have to share this with you. And once again, let me continue to repeat, there is just excellent behavioralists, and I read reports where this is all done. I'll read a report and see good GI testing done and good sensory done. I mean, it's, we just have to make sure that who we are advocating for is getting what they need to get. That's, that's the bottom line, right? Next, if you would. So these are the areas that, you know, that good OTs will look for in terms of what to do. Um, remember, some folks will have hyperactive sense doors, which means there's just too much signaling coming in, and that causes anxiety. And as we mentioned before, unmet need on the one side, anxiety, guess what? Agitation, anger, and aggression, right? I mean, this is, this is what we'll see. The next slide, if you would, Jane. But for some, those, some of those senses will be hyposensitized. In other words, there's not enough signal coming in. Things are too quiet, too dark, too slow, too tickly, whatever. And that will cause anxiety as well, which initially may just give low energy, motivation, whatnot, but eventually will come into repetitive behaviors and other problems. Whether it's hyper or hypo, we have to hit the balance. And each one of us that are functioning more or less okay have got a sweet spot that we found for all our, for our seven sense stores. And that's what we're, we can help make happen through the people who we are supporting. That's why great OTs have done some wonderful work in this field, because it's not just having people do exercises that are going to in, in give them calm at a particular moment with a sense door. It actually grows neuron cells so that this person, they do the activities enough and they can actually regulate themselves more so. Most encouraging. Next, Jane. And then just a summary on that, so much goes back to the gut. I mean, balanced gut, right, is required for a balanced neurotransmitter system. Remember, it's a neurotransmitter system that regulates these sense doors. And it's the gut that regulates how many neurotransmitters. The reason you're able to listen to me today and stay somewhat, somewhat uh, calm and concentrated and whatnot is because of food you had a few days ago. <laughs> That's why you're okay today, because your gut, has given you the neurotransmitters you needed in many, many other aspects of, of who you are. And that is all required for balanced sensory integration and processing, right? So once again, so much goes back to the, right? Next, if you would, Jane. And then near the top, now we're looking at these, these environmental pieces. So I'm gonna read this, and then I'm just gonna see if there's maybe take a few, couple of questions, and then we'll just do a, a short wrap as we're getting near our time. But, but well, underline this, and this could be hung up on any fridge in any home or supporting somebody. It's kind of, I put this together as a composite from the hundreds of folks who I've been privileged to work with. Even though I don't control them, most of my behavioral symptoms are messages to you. My nervous system is asking for you for certain kinds of support to have its specific needs met. Please listen to what it is doing. If you don't, I can't stop it from becoming anxious and frightened. And the main way that it has learned to calm its fears is to get irritated, angry, and even aggressive. I hate when it does that, but the calm that follows my aggression makes me feel normal again. Please help me find a better way. Please help me find a better way. Jane, is there one or two questions that have come in or comments? And, uh, and then we'll kind of look at a, a bit of a wind down. Wondering about um, uh, the video being posted on the, uh, it'll be posted on our community living site. Thank you for your feedback. Um, so much interesting information. 
Okay. Well, there's really no no questions per se. Okay. Okay, well, I just wanted to make sure that we gave folks that opportunity. And um, please, I'm open to receiving emails as well. So just, just know that. Uh, now, there's a couple of hands to... up. So if I could okay. just close the chat. Yeah, um, let's, let's, uh, let's Corrine, you have your hand up. Can I ask you to open your mic? Yes. Hi. First of all, thank you. That was a, a fantastic um, presentation, Peter. And um, my question is around um, children with mental health issues specifically. Um, so maybe children that, you know, up until this point, because um, a lot of the parents I deal with their kids, um, they're coming to us with just mental health challenges at this point. Um, so maybe there's stuff there that's undiagnosed or whatnot. But um, would you say that everything we've been talking about also applies for kids who are really are presenting with, say, just anxiety or just depression? Um, would we want to be looking at the same, you know, the, the same approach and the same, the same type of tests and, and that sort of thing? Right. So um, great question, because it's, you know, there's a lot of prevalence for sure. So I have no trouble in going to where I'm going to go on this one. Um, yes, follow what your, what your GP is working with in terms of a diagnosis, but as soon as possible, simultaneously, get working at getting some of the testing done from a good naturopath or a good nutritionist in some of these other areas. Um, it is, it is when you see the causes of anxiety in the human body and even depression, I've got a book in my library. It's called 100 mimickers of depression. So the behavior is depression. But when you start looking at what's causing it, I mean, some of those vitamins and minerals that I was talking about earlier will cause it. You've got, you've got high levels of copper, like just take copper zinc as an example. You get high levels of, of copper and you have to have anxiety. You don't have a choice. Anyone who's listening to me right now, if you've got excessive copper and you'll have excessive copper and whenever you have excessive copper, you'll have low zinc. So if you test for low zinc, count on you being high copper and there's a certain threshold where anxiety just kicks in and there's dozens of these so the system is set up that you have the symptoms of anxiety depression just like constipation diarrhea like i'm saying to you and i'm not i'm not saying go against what your gp is saying but do not stop there at getting into into an anti-depression or even an, an anti-anxiety even food intolerance is can cause depressions and anxieties too. Now there is a couple of mental health disorders that seem to be fairly prevalent with people with autism and even some other developmental disabilities. And the big one is ADHD, you know, attention deficit hyper disorder. Um, it used to be called ADD where when it had the depressive sign to it and used to, and called ADHD when it had the hyper to it. This is we're seeing fairly prevalent and there's, incredible gains that have been made in dietary help there as well. There's a book called Taking Charge by a Dr. Bartlett. And I've got 20 books in my library on ADHD and people were supporting. I put them all in the box about two years ago. Bartlett's good. He's got ADHD for children and or taking charge for children, taking charge for adults, two different books. It's just a lot of information showing when to use um, medications and also when to look at some of the other comorbidities that could be contributing to it. So yeah, by all means, testing done. The organic acid test through a good naturopathic doctor that knows what they're doing will reveal a lot of what we're talking about here. Low levels in glutathione are another, you know, kind of symptom maker of, of mental health disorders. So yeah, just can't say enough that make sure you do at least a concurrent look through, okay? Thanks for that question. Thank you, Corrine. We'll have Vicki and Andrea. And I'd also like to remind people that our, uh, we'll have a 15 minute break at 1030, then be back at 1045 for care for the caregiver. Just stay on this link. There's nowhere else to go. Just stay here. Um, and then we'll be back out, um, after our break. But please, Vicki, if you would bring your question forward. I need about three, three minutes to close off, Jane, okay? But sure. Vicki, let's hear your question, please. Uh, this will be quick. So um, clearly, uh, 
testing is is one of the key uh, strategies to address um, for what you're saying. So my curiosity is and experience for what about those people who have severe PTS, PTSD, for whom doing anything testing, a wise even taking blood blood pressure, um, they cannot tolerate it. Uh, they won't let it happen um, unless you have to. Um, so my brother, the last time he had blood work was the last time he had general anesthetic. I, I appreciate mm -hmm. this is a longer question to ask or answer. Mm -hmm. um, and also part of the issue is, is uh, many people who are institutional survivors, uh, which my brother is one, have, I don't need to explain anymore, I see you nodding, um, and um, with trauma-informed support. So I'm curious about integrating those um weaving those all together and i appreciate again this is a longer conversation but i just you know give me the magic wand answer peter <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm glad you asked okay because i can give this in 60 seconds or less in it and it'd be very meaningful first of all um <clears throat> some of the testing that we need to to uh to look at anxiety levels coming from ptsd uh, i'll talk about ptsd in a second it must be discussed but some of the testing is not blood. Um, the organic acid test, which picks up 72 biomarkers, 72 biomarkers, it's not a diagnostic test, but it looks at enzymes that are the body's developing in order to cope with some, some issues. 72 biomarkers it picks up, and it's just a urine test. It's just a urine test. Doctors can also do infection tests through, uh, through uh, feces. They can, you know, they can just give you a good indications of, of what can be happening at the infection level through there. And with PTSD, when it's still showing symptoms and activation and bringing people to anxiety, even saliva testing for cortisol, just saliva testing for cortisol, and you can get an indicator of what to do with. But the big question on, on uh, which we're supporting, 50% of people research is telling us have had PTSD and to the point that it's that it's still prevalent in their life. Now that's such a high number that it, it seems to me to make sense to do what you would normally do for anybody. And some of the common strategies that we talk about, what we're going to talk about in the next of this, are really tied to being able to deal with with that, even though it's not a diagnosis of PTSD just help people be calm, which across the board, everyone we support, we need to help them become because just living with a, with a, a disability, right, can, can be so uh, anxiety producing, just being so dependent on other people to take care of your most fundamental needs. It must, we, we can't even imagine, right, what that's like. So I just say, um, bring in a lot of the strategies on calming and uh, even don't worry about even the blood testing for that. Um, you know, so that's, it's like about the best I can do in that time, Vicky, okay? Thank you ever so much. Um, Thank you. Okay, for, for sure. Um, so we're near time. I just thought I would end today on a, a bit of a softer note. Uh, I know I, we have a lot of parents with us today. And uh, my, my wife and I write a bit of poetry on, on what we've learned through the last 15, 18 years in, in this field. And, um, and to really express the gratitude that we have for being able to to support people with development disabilities uh, i mean the you know the gifts that they can bring to us if we're just open and sufficiently conscious to see them so um we wrote this we wrote this poem from a child to a parent but it could be to any any supporter and it tries to reflect you know this the essence of of what we're seeing certain the gifts we've been given and maybe some of you will relate to it okay it's called growing up with a disability dear mom and dad if you hear growing up it's got three meanings in this i know some days you wonder why i have chosen you the answers they will come the anger and fears undo but not before the truth you find hidden in the gifts i give your path to purpose and potential will come as you completely live. Most see me as disabled and your life all but shattered. From this beginning, we will cherish 
all that really mattered. You'll stop caring what they think as you clean your mess. From tiring days emerges your less egoness. And that need to be so perfect, such a worn tight shoe, drives so many into hell, but less and less you. To get everything joyous, that is good enough. This wisdom teaching carries us through much of rough. At first glance to mindless them who just will never know. As your world grows smaller, a special seed you start to grow. While friends feel sad, judging your life forsaken, we have our sacred secret that I'm helping you awaken. Even you don't know just yet, what does this really mean? For this gift that you are growing is seldom clearly seen by those who find they're happy through bigger, better, more, driven by desires, wants, such a seductive horror. And one way that I teach tears ego self apart, brings it to silent presence, opens wide the loving heart. Some days not a pretty sight, anxiety, anger, aggressions. The more I help you lose control, kills unconscious self's obsessions. When you are found often down, hurting every mile, my tender touch to you will bring your soul to laugh and smile. In gratitude, you'll weep, bringing you to still. Then from sacred reflections comes, I'm grist for your love's mill. For as I continue to demand so much of your time, your mind will cry for mercy, then sing an ancient rhyme. A crack in heart's armor will gradually appear. Now for all who suffer, you will share compassion's tear. And what seeps through this crack is love beyond your feelings. So with each allowing lift comes transformational healing. The frustrations that I give, of which you are aware, crucifies the selfish self to create your conscious care. So now with less driven self comes no me and no you. Just usness, never separate, known only by a few. Your I that is we through this labor has its birth. Your life now lived with such precious loving worth. With all of this in mind, I came into your life to help you learn be love through joy and also strife, it seems that to be fully whole, self must yield then breaks from awareness and allowing usness our mind now creates. And though I'll never their race win or have the deepest thoughts, this love that we have nurtured no cognition could have bought. My disability has given a conscious you and me. Because of your selfless love, we are whole. We are free. That's what I've got for you today, team. And thanks for tuning in with us. And uh, hope you can join us after the break as well, okay? Thanks, Jane, for your help there. Thank you so much.